Hello, thank you for joining us. I'm Mindy Mandel and I am here with Jed and the two of us together are going to be going through Gorgias. So we're now on our seventh week and uh, last week, let me pull up the text here. Um, last week we had an interesting talk. This is where they, it, there were so many, many twists and turns. I won't go through all of it, but the question that's being explored at the moment is this question here. Tell me whether you say that pleasant and good are the same thing. And Callias said that, yes, they are the same. And that was where their conversation went from there. And so coming back to where we are now, this is 496D. 496D in the text. And by the way, I always say, and I always forget to say, that we are using the Loeb translation, and this is the uh, Walter Lamb translation. For those of you who don't have the text, there is a link in the description box for a PDF. And if and it's fine, of course, to follow on a with a different translation, and I'll always try to give the Stephanus numbers as we go along. So we are at 496D. And they're going on with this question here. So, Jed, uh, do you want to read Callias or, or I'm sorry, Callicles? I think his name is Callicles or Socrates. Callicles, please. Callicles. Okay. So I'm going to pick up where I put the little blue dot here at the, at the top of the page. So Socrates says, "Then am I to ask you any further questions, or do you admit that?" All want and desire is painful. I admit it. No, do not question me further. Okay, so that's what we're picking up here. They, there was a line of questioning. We don't have to go back over it again. But this was the conclusion, that all want and desire is painful. When you're thirsty, it causes you pain. Hunger is a kind of pain, and so on. All right, very good. But drinking when one is thirsty, you surely say, is pleasant. I do. Now, in this phrase of yours, the words, when one is thirsty, I take it stand for when one is in pain. Yes. But drinking is a satisfaction of the want and a pleasure? Yes. So in the act of drinking, you say, one has enjoyment? Quite so. When one is thirsty? I agree. That is, in pain? Yes. Then do you perceive the conclusion that you say one enjoys oneself, though in pain at the same moment, when you say one drinks when one is thirsty? Or does this not occur at once, at the same place in time, in either soul or body, as you please? For I fancy it makes no difference. Is this so or not? It is. But further, you say it is impossible to be badly off or to feel to fare ill at the same time as one is faring well. Yes, I do. But to enjoy oneself when feeling pain, you have admitted to be possible. Apparently. Hence, enjoyment is not faring well, nor is feeling pain faring ill so that the pleasant is found to be different from the good. Remember, that was the question they were exploring, that Cal Callicles had said that pleasure and good were the same. Right? But now the conclusion is that the pleasant is found to be different from the good. Because you cannot fare well and ill at the same time, good and bad, but you can feel pleasure and pain at the same time at the same time. Right. Hmm. Right. So the pleasure of the cessation hmm. of the being in want and hmm. the suffering of being thirsty hmm. can't mm -hmm. be the good because by definition hmm. you can't be both good and bad. Mm -hmm. They're distinct. Right. Right. I cannot follow these subtleties of yours, Socrates. You can, but you play the innocent, Callicles. Just go on a little further, that you may realize how subtle is your way of reproving me. 
Does not each of us cease at the same moment from thirst and from the pleasure he gets by drinking? I cannot tell what you mean. No, no, Callicles, you must then. Oh, sorry, Gorgias here. No, no, Callicles, you must answer him, for our sakes also, that the arguments may be brought to a conclusion. But Socrates is always like this, Gorgias. He keeps on asking petty, unimportant question until he refutes one. Why, what does that matter to you? In any case, it is not your credit. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It is not your credit that is at stake. Oh, sorry, let me read that again. What does it matter to you? In any case, it is not your credit that is at stake, Callicles. Just permit Socrates to refute you in such manner as he chooses. Well then, proceed with those little cramped questions of yours, since Gorgias is so minded. Okay, now back to Socrates. You are fortunate, Callicles, in having been initiated into the great mysteries before the little. I did not think that was the proper thing. So go on answering where you left off, as to whether each of us does not cease to feel thirst and pleasure at the same time. I grant it. And so with hunger and the rest, does he cease to feel the desires and pleasures at the same time? That is so. And also ceases to feel the pains and pleasures at the same time? Yes. But still, he does not cease to have the good and bad at the same time, as you agreed. And now you do not agree? Sorry, I'm a bit lost. Oh, just what we were saying before, that you can feel pleasure and pain at the same time, but you cannot have good and bad at the same time. So as to whether each of us does not feel, cease mm -hmm. to feel thirst and pleasure. So he's taking the cessation mm. in the same way you can't have both, in the same way you can't cease both at the same time. Mm. So it's the same argument, but the stopping. Mm. Yeah. Right. So cease at so with hunger does he cease to feel the desires and pleasures at the same time so so does he mean when he's when you stop eating mm. so after you finish eating you're no longer getting the pleasure mm. or when the hunger is gone it's not the same pleasure you may keep eating but it's not the same pleasure oh i see so when the hunger is gone, you no longer mm. have the pain of being hungry, but you no longer have the pleasure you get from mm. getting rid of that hunger. Mm. So, that, so that happens at the same time. Okay, mm. right. That is so. Mm. And yes. also ceases to feel the pains and pleasures at the same time. Yes. But still, he does not cease to have the good and bad at the same time as you agreed. And now, do you not agree? I do, and what then? Only that we get the result, my friend, that the good things are not the same as the pleasant, nor the bad as the painful. For with the one pair the cessation is of both at once, but with the other two it is not, since they are distinct. How then can pleasant things be the same as good, or painful things as bad? Or, if you like, consider it another way. For I fancy that even after you do not, for I fancy that even after you do not admit it. Just observe. Do you not call good people good owing to the presence of good things, as you call beautiful those in whom beauty is present? I do. Well now, do you give the name of good men to fools and cowards? It is not that they just now are brave and wise men whom you so describe. Or is it not these that you call good? To be sure, it is. I'm sorry, it was not, I'm sorry, I can't read today. It was not they just now, but brave and wise men whom you describe. And now, have you ever seen a silly child enjoying itself? I have. 
And have you never seen a silly man enjoying himself? I should think I have. But what has that to do with it? Think only answer. I have seen one. And again, a man of sense in a state of pain or enjoyment. Yes. And which sort are more apt to feel enjoyment or pain, the wise or the fool? I think there is not much difference. Well, that will suffice. In war, have you ever seen a coward? Of course I have. Well, now, when the enemy withdrew, which seemed to you to enjoy it more, the cowards or the brave? Both did, I thought. Or if not that, about equally. No matter. Anyhow, the cowards do enjoy it. Very much. And the fools, it would seem. Yes. And when the foe advances, do the cowards alone feel pain, or the brave as well? Both. Alike? More, perhaps, the cowards. And when the foe withdraws, do they not enjoy it more? Perhaps. So now he's, he's changing a little, right? So the foolish and the wise and the cowardly and the brave feel pain and enjoyment about equally, according to you, but the cowardly more than the brave? I agree. But further, are the wise and brave good and the cowards and fools bad? Yes. Then the good and the bad feel enjoyment and pain about equally? I agree. Then are the good and the bad about equally good and bad? Or are the bad in some yet greater measure good and bad? Why, upon my word, I cannot tell what you mean. You are aware, are you not, that you hold that the good are good by the presence of good things, and that the bad are so by the presence of bad things? and that the pleasures are the good things and the pains bad things. Yes, I am. Hence, in those who have enjoyment, the good things, the pleasures, are present so long as they enjoy. Of course. Then good things being present, those who enjoy are good? Yes. Well, now, in those who feel pain, are not bad things present, namely pains? They are. And it is by the presence of bad things, you say, that the bad are bad. Or do you no longer say so? I do say so. Then whoever enjoys is good, and whoever is pained is bad? Certainly. It's a strange argument, huh? You mean those more so who feel these things more, and those less who feel less, and those about equally who feel about equally? Yes. Now you say that the wise and the foolish, the cowardly and the brave, feel enjoyment and pain about equally, or perhaps the cowards even more. I do. Then just help me to reckon up the results we get from our admissions. For you know they say that which seemeth well, tis well, twice and also thrice to tell, and to examine too. We say that the wise and brave man is good, do we not? Yes. And the foolish and cowardly is bad? Certainly. And again, that he who enjoys is good? Yes. And that he who feels pain is bad? Necessarily. And that the good and the bad feel enjoyment and pain in a like manner, or perhaps the bad rather more? Yes. Then is the bad man made bad or good in a like manner to the good man, or even good in a greater measure? Does not this follow along with those former statements from the assumption that pleasant things and good things are the same? Must not this be so, Callicles? Let me tell you, Socrates, all the time that I have been listening to you and yielding your argument, 
I have been remarking the puerile delight with which you cling to any concession one may make to you, even in jest. So you suppose that I, or anyone else in the world, does not regard some pleasures as better and others worse? Oh, oh, Callicles, what a rascal you are, treating me thus like a child. Now asserting that the same things are one way, now another, to deceive me. And yet I started with the notion that I should not have to fear any intentional deception on your part, you being my friend. But now I find I was mistaken. And it seems I must, as the old saying goes, even make the best of what I have got and accept just anything you offer. Well then, what you now state, it seems, is that there are certain pleasures, some good and some bad. Is not that so? Yes. So now the, now his argument is changing a bit, right? Making it a little tighter. So far we've got, the mm -hmm. argument was, if you're having pleasure, it's because you've got a good thing. And if you've got a good well, thing, you are good. Like beautiful things are good because of the presence of beauty. If you're good, it's the presence of good that you're made good. Right. So having good, so having beautiful things means you're beautiful. It means that thing is beautiful. So it, there was not a logical argument, which makes it hard to follow. But right. he was showing so, Socrates was showing the absurdities. I'm sorry. So if you ha you have pleasure when there is a good thing present. When there is a good thing present, you are by definition good. Therefore, you're a good man by having pleasures. But it seems yeah. like the coward has the more pleasure when the enemy right. retreats in battle. So the coward right. who is bad is actually good with that reasoning. Right. So he was showing the absurdity. So even for Callicles, he can recognize that. But we have that his put... argument was absurd. Uh -huh. Right. He, so he, at least he can do that. Um, hmm. Uh, and, and we can take what we can get, as Socrates says. Mm. Um, and that other expression was really cool, too. I'm going to have to remember that. Uh, that which seemeth well, tis well twice, and also thrice to tell. <laughs> as philosophers who pretty much always talk about the same thing, the nature of the self and the good. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's our motto. <laughs> if it's good to say, <laughs> say it as much as you can while you're alive. To whoever That's you can, right. taking mm -hmm. what you can get. Mm. But we have yeah. got this other argument on the table that the brave man feels both the pleasure and the pain to a lesser degree. He's less pained when the army pushes forth and he mm -hmm. has less pleasure when they retreat. Mm -hmm. Is that something that we've discovered in this argument that we're going to be holding on to? That would only follow from Callicles' argument. Um, I, yeah, um, thinking of the of the dialogues we've read together, maybe if you look at the symposium, you see that um, in the description of Socrates as a, a soldier, he was the one who was. He could walk barefoot on the ice and he never complained. And when there was no food, he didn't complain about it. But when they did have food, whatever food they had, he enjoyed it more than anyone else. So I wouldn't say that he fits, that he as a model would fit what came up in this argument. Interesting, because this argument would uh, put the case forward for like the aesthetic. Uh, mm. He feels neither planet pleasure nor pain. Uh, mm. Let it go, this too shall pass sort of mentality mm. towards everything. Mm. And, yeah. And that's, I think, many people's image of temperance, but it's a false image. That's not the model Socrates is presented as. Do you think Callicles mm. is, is it Callicles? It just says C-A-L-L, mm. <laughs> keep forgetting. Mm. Yeah, uh, you can see it up here at the top of the page, Callicles. Callicles. 
Do you think mm-hmm. Callicles is making that point when he points to how much pleasure Socrates gets in engaging in conversation with people and uh, getting conclusions from people? Well, I think in that context, Callicles was not seeing it as a positive thing. He called him puerile, immature. Right. So his interpretation of that mm. might be wrong, mm. but the observation that mm. he is engaging in the higher kind of war, mm-hmm. which requires the higher mm-hmm. kind of bravery, and mm-hmm. he gets pleasure from that, um, mm-hmm. debunks mm-hmm. the idea that the brave man feels neither pleasure nor pain, mm. or to yeah, a small degree. See that. Yeah, Socrates seemed to enjoy doing what he did. Mm-hmm. Right. So... Okay. Where were we? Okay, so coming back to the text here, then. um, So now Callicles has adjusted his position a little. Some pleasures are good and some are bad. Yes. Then are the beneficial ones good and the harmful ones bad? Oh, certainly. And are those beneficial which do some good and those evil which do some evil? I agree. Now, are these the sort you mean? For instance, in the body, the pleasures of eating and drinking that we mentioned a moment ago. Then the pleasures of this sort, which produce health in the body or strength in any other bodily excellence. Are these good and those which have the opposite effects bad? Right. Those which create Mm -hmm. benefit, like strength or excellence, Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, certainly. They're good. And similarly, in the case of pains, are some worthy and some base? Base, of, of course. course, here meaning bad. Hmm. Hmm. Yes, <laughs> not based. Yes. So it is the worthy pleasures and pains that we ought to choose in all of our doings. Certainly. And the base ones, not. Clearly so. Because you know, Polis and I, if you recollect, decided that everything we do should be for the sake of what is good. And that came up much earlier. It was at 467E from that section, for those who want to look back at that. So they made the case that everything we do should be for the sake of what is good. So now we're going to get an interesting argument from here. Do you agree with us in this view that the good is the end of all of our actions and it is for its sake that all other things should be done and not it's done for their sake? Do you add your vote to ours and make a third? (laughs) Uh, I I do say it twice and say it thrice, Socrates. I do. For the sake of the good is the (laughs) end of all of our actions. Mm. I'll make it a third. Thrice. So then it is for the sake of what is good that we should do everything, including what is pleasant, not the good for the sake of the pleasant. Mm, Certainly. Sorry. Certainly. So eager to agree with that. that (laughs) That's such a good one. I love the the say it thrice and then make it a third little connection in there. Now, is it in every man's power to pick out which sort of pleasant things are good and which bad? Or is professional skill required in each case? Professional skill. Then let us recall those former points I was putting to Polis and Gorgias. I said, if you remember, that there were certain industries, some of which extend only to pleasure, procuring that and no more, and ignorant of better and worse, while others know what is good and what's bad. And I placed among those that are concerned with pleasure, the habitude, it's not an art, of cookery. And among those concerned with good, the art of medicine. So he's bringing back in that earlier chart. Now by the sanctity of friendship, Callicles, do not on your part indulge in jesting with me, or give me random answers against your conviction, or again, take what I say as though I were jesting. 
for you see that our debate is upon a question which has the highest conceivable claims to the serious interest even of a person who has but little intelligence. Namely, what course of life is best? So this is what they're really talking about, he's saying. This is where it all goes. This is what they're debating. Is it a life of pleasure or a life of following what is good? Whether it should be that which you invite me with all those manly pursuits of speaking in assembly and practicing rhetoric and going in for politics after the fashion of your modern politicians, or this life of philosophy. So the modern politicians or the life of philosophy. That's what he's using to represent these two positions, right? And what makes the difference between these two? Well, perhaps it is best to do what I attempted a while ago and distinguish them. And then when we have distinguished them and come to an agreement with each other as to these lives being really two, we must consider what is the difference between them and which of them is the one that we ought to live. Now, I dare say you do not yet grasp my meaning. No, I do not. Well, I will put it to you more plainly. Seeing that we have agreed, you and I, that there is such a thing as good and such a thing as pleasant, and that the pleasant is other than the good, so they've cleared that away, and that for the acquisition of either, there is a certain practice or preparation, the quest of the pleasant in the one case and that of the good in the other. But first, you must either assent or object to this statement of mind. Do you assent? I am with you entirely. Okay. And Jed, are you with him entirely also? Yes, what well, we were, what I was calling the hedonism versus, and we also have versus, I guess, the seeking of the good, and here we have that definition that's going to be so important for all of philosophy and all of our reading of Plato. The uh, he's distinguishing that which uh, moves towards our benefit, towards the good of the thing. Requ requiring a kind of a profession being art and those that do not have that um, health and excellence or strength and excellence in mind that benefit um, habitude mm. so that important qualify that art has to be of benefit mm. right yes so some are just habits or he called them flatteries at one point so that's how he's distinguishing the two sections, if you will, if you were to write it out in a chart like I had on there a few weeks ago. So there are those, yes, that follow pleasure and those that follow good. Right. Yeah. And very important for our mm. even um, modern age seems mm. to be halting on just this point. Like those who are artists as a musician, I see this a lot. Uh, and I have mm -hmm. friends who are painters and, and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. They're stuck on this. They're like, well, mm -hmm. what is art? Um, you could nail a banana skin to a wall of a museum yeah. and call that art. Mm -hmm. Isn't that art? Or equally so, that just looks like something my four-year-old could have painted. Why is that art mm -hmm. better art than the other mm -hmm. art? That's an art too. They can't, they're stuck on this. What makes art art? Is it all relative to opinion? Is it just mm. that which stirs conversation? Like, mm. I guess the worst of our politicians stirs the, um, the most controversy in politicians and our worst of our, as we were talking about Tate and his ilk last time, they're the most controversial. They get the most engagement and the most clicks that they somehow mm -hmm. then wedge, they wedge that notoriety into personal development or I can teach you what is the good and I'll be your personal mm -hmm. development person. They all mm -hmm. seem, all these controversial figures like Tate and Peterson and Liver King and whatever seem to want to leverage their controversial opinions into then acting like Socrates. I can tell you how to be 
manly, as Calicles said. Mm -hmm. um, but so they're all stuck on this. Mm -hmm. And how beneficial for our society would it be to just introduce this simple argument? It's not anything and anything is art. Art mm -hmm. has to be of benefit. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and yeah. In our age of social media, I think this is a huge issue because it's not just about political issues of which side of the aisle you're on and the extremists on either side, but it's, I mean, across the board, like healthcare, like you're talking about the uh, liver king, is that what he calls himself? Who ended up getting sick. Um, so <laughs> in any field, whether it's, you know, fine, like I think the worst two things to talk about, people say you should always avoid talking about religion and, and politics. No, I avoid finance and healthcare <laughs> because that's where you get everybody has their opinion of they're absolutely right and everyone disagrees with everyone else and it's miserable but it's because of partly it's because of social media everyone is an expert and yeah they're going for clicks when you're going for clicks you have to go for pleasure but you have to sell it as though it were for benefit and so that's this dialogue exactly fits the problems we have with social media. That's so true. Yes. It's social media. It's politics. Like mm. literally the most controversial figures get the attention, which gets them on the news, which gets the notoriety, which gets them voted in, even if they don't want to sometimes it's, it's exactly this. The uh, pleasure mm. part is the most appealing, but what makes it art is of benefit. And what's interesting is this extends not just to um, politics and finance and healthcare, but also to the arts and like painting and music and stuff. Why, like, mm -hmm. there is no reason why this does not apply to painting, to mm -hmm. music. Is it mm -hmm. just pleasurable or is it just controversial and you get the pleasure of mm -hmm. being angry at it but then you can also ask being controversial does that lead to something beneficial it causes you i think the argument for it in in defense of it being art if i were playing devil's advocate is that by being controversial it causes people to question conventions interesting yes at least people are talking about it mm -hmm. they will say yeah. which which yeah belies the fact that even when defending art for conversation's sake without a mm -hmm. true understanding of what art is supposed to be, mm -hmm. the thing that justifies what they're doing is, is underneath their argument, underneath their thing is that it is beneficial because talking is beneficial. Mm -hmm. So... If they realize that, if they ask that, if someone like you're mm -hmm. saying was asked that follow-up question, oh, so you mm -hmm. think um, con uh, challenging convention and conversation um, is beneficial. Therefore, what justifies, what makes art art is benefit. Mm -hmm. Every artist, every painter, every musician would be forced to say, well, yes, I suppose what makes an art art is benefit. Yeah, I think many would make that case that they see their art as beneficial. Right. Either it's causing conversation or it's stirring the soul. It's inspiring. In, in different artists are doing different things and they're inspired by different, some are more intellectual maybe, maybe more left-brained and some more right-brained. And they may have, you know, different ideas of what they think is needed as the benefit. But I think every artist I've ever met has has seen their art as in some way beneficial. Interesting. I've met a few artists who mm. are artists for the sake of fame or popularity mm. or chasing that's women. Kind of an artist. Yeah, I think um, we'd agree that's an artist. Right. So mm. these this better kind who do have mm. the acceptance that their art is benefit, mm. Um, mm. whether it be challenge, even just stirring conversations and their controversy mm -hmm. or, or mm -hmm. um, challenging conventions and being controversial or whatnot. Um, mm -hmm. 
for, for those people, we can ask the next question, well, if benefit is what we're seeing here, bringing mm -hmm. us to the good, what is the good? Mm -hmm. So a very simple, this, this big debate that is left unresolved in our society, mm -hmm. what is art even? We can say, well, mm -hmm. benefit. Even ask the best mm -hmm. artists and you will find that behind what their reasoning is, is benefit. It's a simple mm -hmm. one word, benefit. And then the next follow-up mm -hmm. question is, well, what is, if benefit is of the good, the next one word response is, what is the good? Or mm. one idea is, what is the good? Because mm. we're seeing here is, bring, benefit isn't bringing you pleasure, but the good. Mm -hmm. Say it twice and thrice. Yeah. Done for the, everything is done for the benefit of the good. And that'll bring us back to the text. So, so Callicles is in entire agreement with Socrates. They're on the same page. Socrates goes on. Then try and come to a definite agreement with me on what I was saying to our friends here and see if you now find that what I then said was true. I was saying, I think, that cookery seems to me not an art but a habitude, unlike medicine, which I argued, has investigated the nature of the person whom she treats and the cause of her proceedings and has some account to give of each of these things. So much for medicine. Whereas the other in respect of the pleasure to which her whole ministration is given goes to work there in an utterly inartistic manner, and this is cookery, of course, without having investigated at all either the nature or the cause of pleasure, and altogether irrationally, with no thought, I may say, of differentiation, relying on routine and habitude, for merely preserving a memory of what is wont to result. And that is how she is enabled to provide her pleasures. Now consider first whether you think that this account is satisfactory and that there are certain other occupations likewise having to do with the soul. So there was about the body, now he's going to go on to the soul. Some are artistic with forethought for what is to the soul's best advantage and others making light of this. But again, as in the former case, considering merely the soul's pleasure and how it may be contrived for her, neither inquiring which of the pleasures is a better or a worse one, nor caring for aught but mere gratification, whether for better or worse. For I, Callicles, hold that there are such. And for my part, I call this sort of thing flattery, whether in relation to the body or to the soul or to anything else, whenever anyone ministers to its pleasures without regard for the better and the worse. And you now, do you support us with the same opinion on this matter, or do you gainsay us? Not I. I agree with you. In order that your argument may reach a conclusion and that I may gratify Gorgias here. Yeah. Gratify so we see him. that we're losing Callicles. He's not engaged anymore. And he's wanting to um, gratify, which seems like that pleasure mm -hmm. flattery mm -hmm. part. Yes. And is this the case with only one soul and not with two or many? No, it is also the case with two or many. Then is it possible also to gratify them all at once, collectively, with no consideration of what is best? I should think it is. Then can you say what are the pursuits which effect this? Or rather, if you like, when I ask you, and one of them seems to you to be of this class, say yes, and when one does not, say no. And first, let us consider flute playing. Does it not seem to you one of this sort, Callicles, aiming only at our pleasure and caring for naught else? Oh, oh, it does seem so to me. Yeah, at least for the listener. Maybe the flute player feels differently, but... And so too with all similar pursuits, such as harp playing in the contests. Yes. And what of choral productions and dithyrambic compositions? 
Are they not manifestly in your view of the same kind? Or do you suppose Kinesius, son of Meles, cares a jot about trying to say things of a sort that might be improving to his audience? Or only what is likely to gratify the crowd of spectators? Oh, as a musician, I, I hope he can come up with something <laughs> to save us. <laughs> well, I think he's just talking about um, pop culture, like the way we listen to it. Maybe the artist is different, but as a listener, it's just for pleasure. That's so interesting. Um, just really, really quick, and I'm sorry to go off on a personal tangent. Last night I was playing a gig and a group of people requested a certain song and I didn't play it because I thought it would not be to their benefit. Mm -hmm. And then after I played, the uh, MC ended up playing the song and it turned out to not be to their benefit. <laughs> and I was puzzling about that and I think we have our answer here. Mm -hmm. Clearly, the latter is the case, Socrates, um, that they don't care a jot about improving their audience. They're just mm. doing what will gratify the crowd, like the MC mm. last night. And what if his father molests? Did he ever strike you as looking to what is best in his ministral see? Or did he perhaps not even make the pleasantest his aim? For his singing used to be a pain to the audience. But consider now, <laughs> do you not think that all minstrelsy and composing of dithyrams have been invented for the sake of pleasure? I do. A little dig at Molestus there. You must have really not been a fan. Anyway. Um, Is he saying that he one... actually did want to try and make his audience better? No. He's saying he was so bad at what he did that it wasn't even pleasant. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> then what of the purpose that has inspired our stately and wonderful tragic poetry? Are her endeavors and purpose to your mind merely for the gratification of the spectators? Or does she strive hard, if there be anything pleasant and gratifying, but bad for them, to leave that unsaid? And if there be anything unpleasant but beneficial, both to speak and sing that, whether they enjoy it or not. Or to which of these two aims, think you, is tragic poetry devoted? It is quite obvious in her case, Socrates, that she is bent rather upon pleasure and the gratification of the spectators. Well, now, what kind of thing, Callicles, did we just see? Now, did we say just now, is flattery. I'm sorry, what is wrong with me? Well, now, that kind of thing, Callicles, did we say just now, is flattery? Certainly. Pray then. And here, it's finally bringing it back around to his earlier list. Pray then, if we strip any kind of poetry of its melody, its rhythm, and its meter, we get mere speeches as the residue, do we not? There must be. And those speeches are spoken to a great crowd of people? Yes. Hence, poetry is a kind of public speaking. Apparently. Then it must be a rhetorical public speaking. Or do you not think that the poets use rhetoric in the theaters? Right. So, on that mm. four-part thing, mm. uh, Fashion, cookery, rhetoric, and sophistry, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Yes. I do think that the poets use rhetoric in the theatres. Mm. Mm. So now we found a kind of rhetoric addressed to such a public as is compounded of children and women and men and slaves as well as free. An art that we do not quite approve of since we call it a flattering one. To be sure, no approval. Mm. Mm. Very well. But now, the rhetoric addressed to the Athenian people or to the other assemblies of freemen in the various cities. What can we make of that? Do the orators strike you as speaking always with a view to what is best, 
with the single aim of making the citizens as good as possible by their speeches? Or are they, like the poets, set on gratifying the citizens? And do they, sacrificing the common weal to their own personal interest, behave to these assemblies as to children, trying merely to gratify them, nor care a jot whether they will be better or worse in consequence? This question of yours is not quite so simple. For there are some who have a regard for the citizens, in the words they utter, while there are also others of the sort that you mention. It's enough for me. For if this thing also is twofold, one part of it, I presume, will be flattery and a base mob oratory, while the other is noble. The endeavor, that is, to make the citizen souls as good as possible, and the persistent effort to say what is best, whether it prove more or less pleasant to one's hearers. But this is a rhetoric you never yet saw. Or if you have any orator of this kind that you can mention, without more ado, let me know who he is. No, upon my word, I cannot tell you of anyone at least of the orators of today. Well then, can you mention one among those of older times whom the Athenians have to thank for any betterment that started at the time of his first harangues as a change from the worst state in which he originally found them? For, mar for my part, I have no idea who the man is. So Socrates is saying that you don't know anyone who is a public figure of the good kind today, mm. and I mm. can't even think of anybody in the past. Right. Yeah. Ooh. Which, but he's raising the idea that at least theoretically, rhetoric can be an art. So he's raising that idea here, but... At this point, they're not suggesting that there are actually anyone who's living it. Right. And I was wondering, yeah. I wonder if the role of the musician is to do the first thing, but try and make it as pleasant sounding <laughs> as possible. Because <laughs> he says, um, uh, earlier he was saying, uh, w is there somebody who, um, if there is something of benefit, but isn't pleasant, they will try their best to do it. And I guess he calls that haranguing. Um, and I was thinking, just thinking back to my show last night, thinking, was what I was trying to do introduce benefit, but also make it pleasant or beautiful or to sort of not not just do the benefit with the haranguing but also make it pleasurable and palatable or beautiful in in some way yeah. yeah you won't sell too many albums if it's not pleasant exactly yeah <laughs> all right well let's see where they go with this um why do you hear no mention of themistocles and what a good man he was, and Simon, and Miltades, and the great Pericles, who has died recently, and whom you have listened to yourself. Yes, Callicles, if that which you spoke of just now is true virtue, the satisfaction of one's own and other men's desires. But if that is not so, and the truth is, as we were compelled to admit in the subsequent discussion, that only those desires which make man better by their satisfaction should be fulfilled, but those which make him worse should not, and that this is a special art, then I, for one, cannot tell you of any man so skilled having appeared among them. Ah, but if you search properly, <laughs> you idiot. <laughs> you will find one. <laughs> then let us just consider the matter calmly and see if any of them has appeared with that skill. Come now, the good man who is intent on the best when he speaks will surely not speak at random in whatever he says, but with a view to some object. I'm sorry, why have I stopped there? He is yes. just like any other craftsman 
who having his own particular work in view selects the things he applies to that work of his, not at random, but with the purpose of giving a certain form to whatever he is working upon. You have only to look, for example, at the painters, the builders, the shipwrights, or any of the other craftsmen, whichever you like, to see how each of them arranges everything according to a certain order, and forces one part to suit and fit with another, until he has combined the whole into a regular and well-ordered production. And so, of course, with all the other craftsmen, and the people we mentioned just now who have to do with the body, trainers and doctors, they too, I suppose, bring order and system into the body. So see, that's what he's talking about here, about bringing order. So that's where it's going. Do we admit this to be the case or not? Uh, yes, I, all of the parts into, f with an eye on a certain order, to mm -hmm. bring it all into an order of the whole, and let's not forget that we had only just mentioned that flattery can extend a wider net. You don't have to know mm -hmm. anything about the individual you, to, to, to make something flattering or make a, a food a tasty dish. Um, but mm -hmm. I think in that previous argument, the implication was um, that benefit might also require a specific focus on the subject that you're dealing with in particular. And he mm -hmm. mentioned the doctor has to know about his uh, patient specifically. Mm -hmm. So we have that in our back pocket, the specificity mm -hmm. of the individual or subject of our art in question, mm -hmm. and with an eye on a certain order, which might be universal, um, itself but mm -hmm. has to be tailored to the specific needs of the subject mm. or audience mm. Good. so two yeah. focuses right so let's see where they go with this one so bringing order and system into the body do we admit this to be the case or not let it be as you say then if regularity and order are found in a house it will be a good one and if irregularity a bad one i agree and it will be just the same with the ship. Yes. And further with our bodies also, can we say? Certainly. And what of the soul? So he likes to start with the physical, right? And then bring it around to the soul. And what of the soul? If it shows irregularity, will it be good? Or if it has a certain regularity and order? Are you saying that there's a certain regularity and order to Socrates' arguments going from the purely physical like the house to the physical, which is also in soul of the body, and then to the soul? Well, that's what he's been doing all along with the cookery. He started with that example, and then he went to the soul. Oh. And now with this argument, he started with the body and the trainer, and then went to, like, to a house, and now... And then what of the soul? All right. And I suppose uh, mm -hmm. fashion or the clothing is just mm -hmm. physical. Um, cookery mm -hmm. deals with the physical, which is also in soul because mm -hmm. you have to eat it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the next level is uh, the soul. Mm -hmm. um, right. Interesting. So in that chart, there was body and soul. Right. He's, he divided it into body and soul. Mm -hmm. and, and here from house... Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like a physical thing to a doctor. Mm -hmm. Doctor often is the mean because it's, mm -hmm. it's physical, but it's also dealing with an insult thing. Um, uh, yes, so there is a regularity and order in Socrates' argumentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what the ship and what of the soul? Yes, health mm -hmm. and... Wait, uh, wait. If it shows irregularity, will it be good? Or if it has a certain regularity and order? Our former statements oblige us to agree with this also. So you see, again, he's lost Callicles, right? He's not wholeheartedly agreeing. He's saying, well, our former statements require us to be consistent and agree. So do you think he's dropping the ball <laughs> and letting him get away with mm -hmm. this, considering he says you have to have a specific eye to the subject? Um, I think he's doing as much as he can with Callicles. You can't force someone to be interested. 
and maybe because there are other people listening as well. So it's for their benefit too. Right. So he's got an eye on the subject, which is mm. actually, we mm. see this in some of the other dialogues where Socrates says, oh, cause my, um, oh, damn it. Uh, in, in the Republic, who does Socrates, uh, start with? Who's his friend? Glaucon. Glaucon, yes. Because Glaucon says we should talk about justice. Let's talk about justice. Mm. So mm. he's also got, he's got an eye on the specific mm. subject of, of mm. Glaucon, his student. Mm. Interesting. Right. Good point. Mm. Um, um, then what name do we give to the effect of regularity and order in the body? Health and strength, I suppose you mean. I do. And what again to the effect produced in the soul by regularity and order? Try to find the name here and tell it me as before. Well, I'm one of those materialists, maybe, so I don't know much about the soul. Why don't you name it yourself, Socrates? Well, if you prefer it, I will. And do you, if I seem to you to name it rightly, say so. If not, you must refute me and not let me have my way. For it seems to me that any regularity of the body is called healthiness, and this leads to health being produced in it, and general bodily excellence. Is that so or not? Health and excellence, it is. And the regular and orderly states of the soul are called lawfulness and law. And so there we see the idea of legislation being raised a bit higher than what the footnotes in the book before was suggesting. So in the soul, these states are called lawfulness and law, whereby men are similarly made law-abiding and orderly. And these states are justice and temperance. Do you agree or not? Okay, so... Does that right. respond one to one? Like, uh, we've got health mm -hmm. and excellence, one and two. Lawfulness is like health, and law itself is like excellence. Can you say that again? Um, we've got health and excellence in the body. Uh -huh. And then he says, we call these lawfulness and law. Mm -hmm. would, mm. would that mean lawfulness is like health? and law itself is the excellence of the soul? Yeah, here we have a ness, right? Healthiness, lawfulness. It's the state or nature of something. And in general, we call it, we have an excellence in law. So does that mean that justice mm -hmm. is to the health of the soul mm -hmm. and temperance to the excellence? Oh, I'm not sure. I'm, I'd have to think about that. I'm not sure if he's matching it up the same. It's a good question. Mm, because um, mm -hmm. the, the alternative reading is um, mm -hmm. to take away the word mm -hmm. excellence and, and uh -huh. say uh, it's called healthiness and this leads to health. And uh -huh. general body excellence, we're not distinguishing uh -huh. as a separate category. So we've got the ness of healthiness and health mm. and the ness of yeah. obeying the law and law itself. Mm -hmm. And then the state of justice follow, oh, mm -hmm. but then uh, maybe you want to swap it around. around. <laughs> yeah. My knee jerk reaction is to turn them around. That temperance is the healthiness manifesting in your behavior. Whereas justice is the excellence of the whole functioning as a unity. Me too. Mm. But that's a good question. And he, there must be a reason he put him in this order. So it's something to think about. Could it be one of the um, puzzle giving t uh, techniques that he wants the reader to do a bit of work and flip him? Um, I'm not sure. You could, you certainly make it into a puzzle. Because that would be unpleasant for the reader. Yeah. It would be more pleasant to read it flowing yes. with them done for you, the puzzle solved. But uh, it would be maybe less pleasant. 
yeah, less mm, pleasant yeah. and more benefit mm. for the reader to do some work, mm. which is interesting. I go. had a songwriting teacher who says, um, uh, when you're writing songs, uh, give them one plus one. Don't give them, or get, give them two plus two. Don't give them four. Like, like it's better. It's more. Um, he was talking about writing appealing songs, but even in that way, um, leave something for the listener to do. Like, don't tell them the answer. Don't tell them four, but give them two plus two. So if they listen hard, there is something uh -huh. that they can do and get the answer mm -hmm. themselves. And it, that's mm -hmm. going to be a more appeal, but also benefit. So maybe mm -hmm. this is one of those, he's giving us two mm -hmm. plus two. He's giving us the terms. Mm -hmm. Ah, he's giving us the terms, but not giving us the appropriate order. Mm -hmm. And if it's... In the section about order. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Puzzling. Mm -hmm. Be it so. Yeah. Oh, that's good. I hadn't thought about that, why he put them in that order. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe we'll read just another page or so. There's a spot where we can, a good stopping point on the next page. So maybe just read a little bit more. Okay. All right, so do you agree or not? Uh, I will not say, but I will say, be it so. <laughs> Then it is this that our orator, the man of art and virtue, will have in view when he applies to our souls the words that he speaks, and also in all his actions, and in giving any gift he will give it, and in taking anything away he will take it, with this thought always before his mind, how justice may be engendered in the souls of his fellow citizens, and how injustice may be removed, how temperance may be bred in them, and licentiousness cut off and how virtue as a whole may be produced in vice expelled. Do you agree with this or not? I agree. For what advantage is there, Callicles, in giving to a sick and ill-conditioned body a quantity of even the most agreeable things to eat and drink, or anything else whatever, if it is not going to profit thereby any more? Let us say, then by the opposite treatment, on any fair reckoning, it may profit less. Is this so? Be it so. Because, I imagine, it is no gain for a man to live in a depraved state of body, since in this case his life must be depra a depraved one also. Or is not that the case? Yes. And so the satisfaction of one's desires, if one is hungry, eating as much as one likes, or if thirsty, drinking is generally allowed by doctors when one is in health. But they practically never allow one in sickness to take one's fill of things that one desires. Do you agree with me in this? Mm, yes, I do. And does not the same rule, my excellent friend, apply to the soul? See, there it is again, body and then soul. So long as it is in a bad state, thoughtless, licentious, unjust, and unholy, we must restrain its desires and not permit it to do anything except what will help it to be better. Do you grant this? I do. For thus I take it, the soul itself is better off? To be sure. And is restraining a person from what he desires called correcting him? Yes. And here's where I'll stop here with then correction is better for the soul than uncorrected license, as you were thinking just now. I want to stop there because that brings the whole conversation back to the much earlier discussion that it's better to be wronged than to do wrong. But if you do wrong, it's better to be corrected. He called it being punished, but here he's calling it being corrected than to be left uncorrected. So he brought the whole discussion back to where it was before. Right. And I remember earlier I was making the point that mm -hmm. um, correction, well, mm. this is... Punishment has a very different feeling than correction, yes. And using the order of mm. this to order my thinking and therefore my soul, mm -hmm. um, I mm -hmm. would say the, the, uh, the, the problem I was having and the strong disdain that I was having for 
punishment is because punishment would be in that order of fashion, cookery, rhetoric, and mm. sophistry. Correction would be its higher equivalent in the art set. Yes, that's well said. Yeah, punishment is sometimes it's done. They People say it's for the betterment of the person who's being punished, but it's really the pleasure of the punisher. Exactly. So it was in the category of pleasure, whereas proper, like a proper um, punishment would be a correction. Which is very interesting because I have heard people, parents who say um, uh, they punished their children because they d had it done to them until they realized that it was entirely about them and it was mm. never teaching the child anything that would benefit mm. them. Mm. So it, it is not only, so we have the point here that the art has the, su the focus on the subject, not yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's not happening when there's punishment. It's for the parent, and, but mm. also it's for the pleasure of the, the, the parent mm. because they're not actually becoming beneficial. And mm. yeah, and we were saying not only is punishment um, something that gives uh, a sick kind of pleasure but uh, for a parent, but for many other professions like famously police get a lot of mm -hmm. pleasure for inflict inflicting punishment mm -hmm. on others and it's sadistic and mm -hmm. many pro people yeah. seek professions in which yeah. they can gain pleasure from inflicting yeah. punishment well, which certainly. is the negative kind yeah. and not the benefit in any good profession kind. where a person has some sort of power over someone else whether it's police or teacher or even doctors you will find some who abuse that authority in that position. Right. Yeah. And we seem to be going through hopefully a transitional mm -hmm. phase with mm -hmm. uh, the famously the Me Too movement talking about people in authority yeah, good example. Uh, who, mm -hmm. who are acting for their mm -hmm. personal pleasure, mm -hmm. which would lead into the next question, well, what then would be the benefit? And how can we instill that in every profession formally such that we can simply and easily point to any profession and say mm -hmm. what specifically is the benefit um, and what specifically are the, the steps or the ordered process mm -hmm. of reaching that benefit? While also, mm -hmm. how can we um, set up safeguards so that we're not mm -hmm. focused on the person in authority Mm -hmm. as the subject and mm -hmm. pleasure as the mm -hmm. goal. Mm -hmm. If we had that simply in our world, we would fare much better. Yeah, right. And just think about what is the the purpose of this position and whether it's like the entertainment industry, they're there to hire singing acts or hire actresses or whatever um, and to make movies and or make albums in the case of the music industry. Um, yeah, if they just focused on that, obviously, you know, the power abuse, I think it's very easy to see the distinction there between the proper goal and the goal of the, the pleasure of the person in power. Um, but yeah, what we're seeing here to bring it back to the text is the idea that, um, ultimately you need a healthy soul. Right. If these people all had healthy souls, the people who abuse their position are people who don't have healthy souls. And so bringing order to the soul is ultimately what's going to make the world a better place. Why well, I often say right. that the world won't be a better place until the people in it are better. And so we need a healthy soul. And so that's what However, this is all about. Mm. However, exactly. Yeah. However, he did just say that uh, mm -hmm. we should, in our societies, um, go through mm -hmm. a a process mm -hmm. of uh, just scrolling up a little bit here, engendering in others, training, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, I can't remember where it was, but we only just read that uh, if there was a society that trains the justice and temperance mm -hmm. 
-hmm. it would be easier to therefore engage in the activity of ordering us. Mm -hmm. So if we have ordered souls ourselves, we can create a better society. Mm -hmm. But equally so, if we grew up in a better society, it would be easier for us to go through the process of ordering mm -hmm. our souls. That's chicken egg. Chicken egg. Yeah. Right. And it's interesting that um, uh, this applies. Well, we could say, well, the basic definition of fascism mm -hmm. could fall under this category. It's the dictator uh, acting not for his subjects, but for himself, number mm -hmm. one. And number two, so that's the first part, eye on the subject, uh, not uh, and for his pleasure and not for his, the benefit. Mm -hmm. So there's that pleasure benefit versus subject and authority or, or, or mm -hmm. artist. Mm -hmm. um, and very easily we could, well, very easily if anyone reads the Gorgias, <laughs> um, <laughs> But then we could say, well, hang on a second. Every job that I've ever had in a capitalist system has never been about my benefit as the worker. It's always been about the uh, owner, mm -hmm. the uh, capital holder. Um, and it's never been anything that benefits himself. It's only ever been for him acquiring pleasure through money. It's never been about the benefit of the society in which he lives or the benefit about the people he works in, or even the benefit of his own soul. It's only ever been about seeking pleasure. And it's never, ever been about the, the person who he's engaging with or the workers who he engages with. So we can see capitalism mm -hmm. itself is a system that very well falls into the fascist or the corrupt or the, the bad type of society hmm. yeah i mean ideally there is benefit for the employee as well if they enjoy their job and they get some benefit from it but there are certainly many jobs that are not like that just punching a clock and nothing personally beneficial except it's not it's not written money, in getting the salary yeah mm -hmm. like there may be some mm -hmm. You might, you know, find a pleasure in your job in spite of the fact mm -hmm. that you know you're engaging us in an activity specifically where the whole system is designed for the owner to siphon profit. Profit mm -hmm. means he's going to exploit you in some way, not paying mm -hmm. you the fair share, skimming off. Yeah. And we all know like planned obsolescence where mm -hmm. if we can make the iPhones that, that die quickly, which mm -hmm. means more yeah. pollution, exploiting the resources, all these sort of things. Mm -hmm. We will do that externally, cap uh, the mm -hmm. uh, capitalists call it externalizing costs, making the planet and the people suffer um, and pay for it for your own personal mm -hmm. gain. It's mm -hmm. always personal for the capitalists mm -hmm. and it's never beneficial. Mm -hmm. So we, we should fix mm -hmm. that. Yeah, there are many flaws in our system. Specifically, these two. Yeah, yeah. So we can make the many, mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. we can take that two to a one. We could say there's one mm -hmm. flaw in the system. It is a flattery and not an art. Mm. And then we can say, well, hang on a second. One, that, that's, that seems to, can you be mm. more specific? Well, I can make the one two. Well, it's the subject and not the, mm -hmm. uh, so we, you're focusing on the doer and not the subject. Mm -hmm. That's number one. And number two, it's uh, pleasure and not benefit. Mm. Yeah. But what we're focusing on here is the soul. Right. And so that each of us individually, maybe I'm not going to fix the whole um, American economic system, but I can certainly put my own soul in order. And maybe if enough people with souls in order get together there will be changes to and, you know slowly societies are changing there will be changes on the macro level but we certainly have to work on ourselves and that's something we can always do yes and i was only i was only doing it as a metaphor uh, mindy yeah. Yeah. to communicate my own soul i wasn't i was thinking <laughs> about it only as this transitional ordered step to talk about my soul mm -hmm. and specifically because i'm mm -hmm. a philosopher yeah, and it certainly does apply. Yes, I think it was a good point to make. So, um, but let's um, end it there because that's a good stopping point. Then they're going to go on with the discussion from that point into another direction. And we'll pick up with that next time, I think maybe two or maybe three more weeks.
to get through this dialogue. We're more than halfway That's a good through one. now. Mm -hmm. Such a good one. It is a really good one. Yeah, so much I, in it. Yeah, this is a really good one. I really don't know why it's not more famous than it is. But it's one of the better ones, I think. So Yeah. I'm and even the earlier oh, sorry, really quickly, even the earlier conversations we've we we're having about how mm -hmm. um cleverly or I guess cleverly Socrates was navigating the problems faced that we ourselves mm -hmm. face when we try and say it twice and thrice. We try and talk about philosophy with our friends or try and have a mm -hmm. reasoned discussion. Like you were saying a moment ago, um, there's a rule that we can't talk about politics or we can't talk about religion. Well, these are the most important things to talk about. These are the things we should be talking about. We should be saying it twice and thrice. But um, why is it that the things we should be talking about the most religion which is you know the modern or the clothing version of philosophy um and, and politics which is the mean term um why why is the things we should be talking about the most the most beneficial why is it the most taboo hmm. and i think maybe one of the reasons is the conversations are not pleasurable and without hmm. an awareness of the ordered pattern, the ordered whole, which is needed for the health and excellence, then we're sort of our conversations are undirected and they go around in circles and, and you're ended up with mm -hmm. everything is nothing and everything is relative. So why even talk at all or why even have this discussion? Ban it from the dinner table. Um, but earlier we were talking about how well, Socrates can navigate that uncomfortableness mm. and also circumvent, like get ahead. Oh, I know you want to make a speech, um, but please don't do that. Oh, and I know you'll say I want to make a speech because freedom, because isn't it freedom? But mm. I have the freedom not to listen and, mm -hmm. and so let's not do that. And also he, he said, oh, but you're a, whenever so Callicles does something well, he calls him uh, excellent Callicles or wonderful Callicles or lovely Callicles. And, mm. but, and so there's this interesting use of adjectives to mm. um, uh, correct or to, to guide as well. So there's all this... Um, artfulness in the way in which Socrates makes the the beneficial more pleasant mm -hmm. that we talked about earlier mm -hmm. and now we're going on to say okay what he's talking about is this distinguishing of and the benefit mm -hmm. but like you were saying with music you need both mm -hmm. and this dialogue is so wonderful it's presenting both He's saying, hey, mm -hmm. look how cool he is. Wouldn't you love to be able to do this and have these conversations mm -hmm. that are the band and we need? Mm -hmm. And it's frustrating if you can't have mm -hmm. them because what are we doing? <laughs> yeah. mm. But then, yeah, you need to be able to have them, number one. You have to be pleasant. You have to be charming in a way. Um, and, which I, and we were talking about how even that must have an ordered system. Like Socrates is using it freely mm -hmm. as a doctor mm -hmm. uses his understanding of the ordered system of the body freely to, in the moment, deal with the, the patient and adjust himself and, and maybe make jokes to make them feel more at ease or whatever he is. He's using, he's using the ordered system in a charming way to be more relatable to his subject. Well, mm -hmm. Socrates is doing that too, which must mean there must be an ordered system in how he's uh, able to recognize the arguments. Oh, you're using these three, a part of an ordered system. You're trying to be gross to make my skin crawl, or you're trying to appeal mm -hmm. to the many, or you're trying to mock mm -hmm. me. There is an ordered system there that he's using in his delivery, which mm -hmm. is the, the making it pleasant part. Mm -hmm. And then there's the second part, there's the pleasant and then the benefit. Mm -hmm. There must equally be an ordered system that might even be the same archetypal order, mm -hmm. but applied to the benefit of the soul too. So in your delivery as a philosopher, which we all want to be, well, if you're subscribed to this channel anyway, and in... Um, the delivery as a philosopher and in the good that we're seeking as a philosopher, an ordered system that if we can see and nail down to the point where we can see through it, we can integrate as a whole and be one of these 
orators or musicians that he's talking about that, that are hard to find, that can do both. And we started off at the first thing and we got to the second thing and it's all in this one dialogue. How amazing. Yeah, that was a nice summary of the dialogue. And so um, <laughs> we'll end it there. Um, so again, another maybe two or three weeks to get through this dialogue and there's still more good stuff coming. So those of you watching on YouTube, um, I hope that you'll join us next time. As always, I encourage you to leave a comment and also please like and subscribe if you don't already. It really does help the channel a lot. And I hope that we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.